jump in. Um, welcome to the Preservation North Carolina Shelter Series, um, virtual programming about places that matter. My name is Clarissa Goodlett and I'm the Communications Director at Preservation North Carolina. This time when sheltering has become cent a central part of our lives, we wanted to create a space to connect with you to explore the culture, architecture, diversity and stories of the many buildings and houses that serve as shelters across our state. We will continue to add shelter series events throughout 2021. So please visit our website for uh, upcoming events. You can go to preservationnc.org. Uh, Preservation NC is delighted to present the shelter series to you for your charge, but we are always grateful for your continued support of our programming. If you're enjoying this series, please consider a gift to help us keep it going. Uh, we've provided a, a giving link in the survey that will appear at the end of the program, or you can visit our website at preservationnc.org. Uh, this afternoon, we're excited to present A Day of Blood, Preserving the History of the 1898 Wilmington Insurrection. We'll be talking with historian and author, Lorraine Umfleet, to examine the details of the Wilmington Insurrection and the long-term impact of that day in both North Carolina and the nation, including connections to historic buildings and locations in Wilmington. Luray currently works with the Department of Natural and Cultural Resources to develop outreach and specialty programming projects on behalf of the Secretary's Office. Throughout her career in public history, Luray has worked with a multitude of sites in, in a variety of capacities including the Office of Archives and History, the North Carolina Collection and Davis Library in Chapel Hill, the Joel Lane Museum House in Raleigh, and Historic Hope Plantation in Windsor. Originally from Bath, North Carolina, Luray graduated from UNC Chapel Hill with a bachelor's degree in history. She received a master's degree um, from East Carolina University. Luray published A Day of Blood, the 1898 Wilmington Race Riot, based on research for which she was awarded the American Association of State and Local History Award of Merit and their prestigious WOW Award. Is it WOW or W-O-W or is WOW? Okay. That's what wow. <laughs> WOW. WOW Award. Wow. Um, so thank you, Luray, for joining us. Um, we also have with us filmmaker Chris Everett. Chris combined his love for history and film to direct and produce his first feature length documentary, Wilmington on Fire, chronicling the Wilmington insurrection of 1898. The film has been screening nonstop at various film festivals, museums, cultural centers, universities, and nonprofit organizations. A self-taught documentarian, Christopher won Best Director First Documentary Feature Award at the Pan-African Film Festival in 2017. Chris's work has been featured in several local and national publications, including The New Yorker, BBC News, New York Amsterdam News, NPR, Sin East, Shadow and Act, and IndieWire. His documentary films have been featured on Amazon Prime, Quelly TV, Tubi TV, Free Press TV, and BET+. He is currently working uh, with us at Preservation North Carolina on a project about black builders and architects in North Carolina. And so uh, before I turn it over to Lorraine and Chris, um, I'm gonna just quickly go over a few um, Zoom FYIs in case you're new to our series or new to um, uh, using Zoom. And I also just wanted to remind folks um, that our Bellamy Mansion Museum in Wilmington is, is now open um, for visitors. So you can take tours there and learn more about um, the, our topic for today, the insurrection, or um, just about Wilmington history in general. And you can also buy Lorraine's book there as well. Um, so yeah, so I'm gonna do this real quick. Um, yeah, so we're in a webinar format. Um, so everybody except for our panelists are muted your video is uh, disabled and so we can't hear or see you, but we know you are there and we thank you all for coming. We are recording this session. Um, it's also live streaming on um, Facebook and it will make it available to view later 
on our website um, and social media channels. If you're having technical issues, please utilize the chat function, which is that little button there with the little uh, chat bubble, and we'll do our best to assist you. Um, if you're interested in asking questions, um, we'll be doing a Q&A session at the end of the presentation, and I'll be moderating um, the questions from attendees. So you can uh, type in your question at any point. Um, and there's a Q&A button also at the bottom of your screen. Just click that and type in your question. Um, and what comes time, I will, um, I'll bring up that question and, and say your name. Um, you can also ask anonymous anonymously as well, um, but we'll do that at the very end. And if you all would just take a few minutes, it's a really short survey. Um, it's gonna pop up uh, at the end when you close out your screen, once you leave the webinar. Um, we're really interested in your feedback about you know, how this session went, um, ideas and thoughts about how we can improve our uh, next shelter, shelter series events. So if you'll take some time to do that, um, addition of popping up at the end, you'll get an email tomorrow. And so you'll have another opportunity then to fill out the um, survey. All right, uh, that's it for me. I'm gonna turn it over uh, to Lorraine. Well, thank you for having me, Clarissa. And hello, everyone. I see names I recognize over there in the list of participants. So hello for my old friends and hello to new friends. Um, when talking about preparing for this talk, I wanted to know sort of what I needed to talk about for uh, the Bellamy. And Gareth pointed out that there's gonna be a wide variety of listeners to this event talk. And um, some of you may know all about 1898. Some of you may know a little bit about 1898. Some of you might be wanting to learn more and more. So I'm gonna give a general overview of the causes and effects of 1898. And that means I'm going to skim over a whole lot of stuff because this took me three years of researching and writing to create the report. And then the book was another three years. And it's almost 20 years out from my first work on the 1898 um, commissions project. And um, I'm still learning things about Wilmington, about 1898, about the victims and the perpetrators. So I'm going to give you a big overview story of 1898 and then I'm um, going to tie it back down to our built environment today. And I'm then going to turn it over to Chris and he can speak to you about some of the great work he's been doing. I'm a historian first and a technological person second. So sharing my screen is going to be a new task for me. So I'm doing it and so does that look good? Yeah, we can see it, Lorraine. Great. Okay. So, um, A Day of Blood at Wilmington. That's the headline from the November 11th News and Observer in Raleigh. And um, I, fit, I thought that was pretty fitting. So I've used that as my title for a lot of things, including my book. And so I'll just go right straight into it. To understand 1898, we have to understand that the events of that year that led to the violence on November 10th were part of a larger political power struggle, that it wasn't spontaneous, it wasn't um, an accident. Things happened in a planned, um, purposeful way in Wilmington. And we have to understand the politics of 1898 to get to the total story. And I'm going to talk about Democrats and Republicans, but we have to know that the Democrats and Republicans of 1898 are not Democrats and Republicans of 2021. The Democrats of 1898 are led by Fernifold Simmons. He was um, their standard bearer, statewide control kind of person. And his base were people who were former Confederate veterans. They are uh, conservative in many approaches to their personal, civic, and religious lives and business activities. And um, White supremacy is their platform, has been the Democratic Party platform since the end of the Civil War. And 1898 was the first time that uh, Simmons was successfully able to unite everyone under that one singular banner of white supremacy. On the other end of the spectrum, we have Daniel Russell, who's our Republican leader for the state. And the Republican Party is 
the party of Abraham Lincoln. African Americans are voting for Republicans at this time. And other Republican voters are made up of white businessmen who were from North Carolina and others who had come down to North Carolina from other places after the Civil War was over. So it's a progressive party and it's the party of African American voters. In the middle you have the Populist Party and the Populist Party was started in the 1880s as a group of Democrats pulled away from the party and felt like they needed a new party to address their needs and their concerns. But the Populists and the Republicans were a minority in the total voting population of the state of North Carolina individually. So by 1896, the populists and the Republicans realized that if they were gonna do anything to defeat the Democrats at the voting box, they were gonna to have to merge or fuse their voting power. So this is called fusion, where the populists and the Republicans came together in an uneasy alliance to merge their voting power against the Democratic Party. That resulted in Daniel Russell becoming the first governor of North Carolina that was from the Republican Party since the end of Reconstruction. And it also resulted in a legislature in Raleigh that passed le legislation to make all of the things that the 13th, 14th, 15th amendments and the Declaration of, of Independence and the Constitution all promised to African Americans and everyone in North Carolina that it was an egalitarian government for everyone. So that's the climate of the party system in 1898. Simmons was a very good organizer and Josephus Daniels out of Raleigh pointed out that Simmons used every tool in his toolbox to do the things that he needed to do to win the election in 1898 because he needed to take control of the 1898 election and win that year to regain control of the state legislature so that by 1900 he could win control of the governor's office and by the end of the 19 elect 1900 election his goal was to have the democrats control of both the legislature and the governor's office for perpetuity that's what happened that was a spoiler alert but we're going to learn how he did it he used this three-part control system that Daniels talked about, men who could write, men who could ride, and men who could speak. And so this is an example of men who could write. It's the News and Observer. It's the newspapers of Wilmington and all the other pro-democratic party newspapers across North Carolina. They would publish articles of any sort and any kind to persuade their readers to support the Democratic Party because they needed to protect their families, they needed to protect their businesses, they needed to protect the integrity of white men. And we also have to remember that not everyone could read and write in 1898 like they do today. So some folks might pick up the newspaper and see this cartoon and think, I know what this newspaper is talking about and I want to agree with it. Furthermore, we have headlines throughout the state and specifically in Wilmington that are meant to persuade and inflame readers to support the Democratic Party through whatever means necessary. Daniels even said if he had to tell a lie or expand on the truth to get people to see his side of the story in the pro-democratic newspaper, he would do it. Men who could speak are men like Alfred Moore Waddell. We have speech makers traveling all over North Carolina at this time, supporting the Democratic Party ticket. And this is in the time before 24 hour news cycles on television and the internet. So the only way that people are gonna get their news is through that newspaper and through these speakers. And the speakers had to be flamboyant, they had to be good orators, and they had to be uh, full of passion for their topic. And Waddell of Wilmington is one of those passionate speakers. I have an excerpt from a speech he gave on November 7th, the day before the election, and it can't get much more clear about what he thinks about how the Democratic Party needs to win. If you see a Negro out voting, tell him to leave. If he refuses, shoot him, kill him down in his tracks. We shall win tomorrow if we have to do it with guns. So it's pretty violent. Um, refrain, but he repeated it over and over and over. He even said, if we have to choke the Cape Fear River with the carcass of dead black bodies, we will do that so that we can win the election. Waddell was such a good speech maker. Um, he made Wilmington a flashpoint. If it wasn't already one, he made it even more of one. And finally, we have men who could ride. These are red shirts. And the red shirt phenomenon is only seen in North Carolina in 1898 and 1900. And it came into North Carolina from South Carolina, and it's really 
mostly visible along the South Carolina border. And every opportunity when there was a speech making event happening, the red shirts were all around, they were doing parades and they wanted everyone to know who they were because they wore these bright red shirts, plain faces, nothing covering them, broad daylight, and they would go into African-American neighborhoods and rough up potential voters and intimidate them to keep them away from the polls, to scare them away from voting. And then on the day of the election, they stood at the polls watching how people voted and making sure that uh, if you were a white man, you were voting for the Democratic ticket. And if you were a black man, you weren't allowed to get into the polls, if at all possible. So that's the three pronged approach that um, Furnifold Simmons used to win the election in 1898. So why Wilmington? It was the largest city in the state at the time. It had about 20,000 people in the city, almost 50 50 per, uh, black and white residents. And Wilmington was what the New South could hope to look forward to at the turn of the 20th century. African-Americans in Wilmington had higher wages than other places in North Carolina. There was more home ownership in the African-American population. Education levels were higher. So regardless of your race, Wilmington was a place where things had a promise of um, being better. It's not to say it was perfect, I mean, because African-Americans still had to deal with um, white supremacy overtones, but it was the place where an entrepreneur could hopefully make it. If he was gonna make it anywhere in North Carolina, it was gonna be in Wilmington. Wilmington had a board of aldermen and a mayor that reflected that fusion activity from 1896. So it had a Republican mayor and an African-American and white board of aldermen running the events of the city. Uh, the election for 1898 was not for the Board of Aldermen. That wouldn't take place until the following year. So when we talk about things a little bit later, we have to remember that the Board of Aldermen and the mayor for Wilmington at the time of the violence was still a Republican-led entity. In the mix of all of this, we have Alex Manley. And Manley was well-educated African-American who had moved to Wilmington to open a newspaper and run what was known as the Wilmington Daily Record. And Manley took every opportunity to use his paper as a pro-Republican uh, piece to support Republican policies, Republican candidates, and help the African-American community understand what was going on in the big city of Wilmington in the state of North Carolina. And Manley became a target of the, African, of the um, white supremacy campaign in Wilmington and his articles and his editorials were taken out of context and published in the Wilmington Democratic Party papers as an example of what those big black burly brute men are like and we need to do all we can to keep these African-American black men in their place and not making them uh, challenge white men for rule of the city. Election day comes and um, the Democratic Party had done such a very good job of intimidating voters and keeping them away from the registrations and the voting polls that the Democrats won every seat that they had a, a candidate up for. Now, there was some election fraud there, and we can go into that later, but um, as a result of the election, the state legislature changed in capacity from being a fusion legislature to one that was majority Democrat. And that will play a role in the future of North Carolina and the state. So November 9th comes. The Democratic Party has won. But remember, the Board of Aldermen in the city is still in control of the Republican Party and an African-American white coalition. So the leaders of the city came together. And there was this other group of men running things at the similar level in Wilmington and New Hanover County as what you saw at the state level with Simmons. And these men came together and said, you know, we're not going to take this anymore. We've done all of this work to get our white supremacy platform through. We're going to continue and make it to the next level. We, the undersigned citizens of Wilmington and New Hanover, do declare we will no longer be ruled by men of African origin. This is called the White Declaration of Independence. And then they lay out a series of demands. 
Alex Manley needs to stop his printing. Alex Manley needs to leave the city. The Board of Aldermen need to resign. African-American workers need to be fired. White workers need to be hired in their place. All of these different things were laid out in demands. The demands were given to a group of African-American leaders who were supposed to provide Alfred Moore Waddell, that speech maker who made himself the chair of this committee. Uh, they were supposed to give him their reply by the next morning on November 10th as to how they, the African-American community, was going to meet the demands of this white declaration of independence. Because Wilmington was an armed camp, we have to think that we know that guns were being distributed wide wholesale across Wilmington before the election. There were patrols on every street corner and African-Americans who were traveling across the city. If you were living in an African-American section of town, but you were working in a white section of town, at every corner you were going to be stopped, you were going to be roughed up, you were going to be questioned as to where you were going. And it was very, very frightening for African-Americans to travel through the white community. But this answer from those men who was supposed, it was supposed to be delivered to Waddell, it didn't make it to him. Um, he knew what the content of the, the letter of reply was, that we're gonna do everything we can for the press, you know, for peaceful life in Wilmington, but the official letter didn't get to Waddell in time. So on the morning of November 10th, a group of men met here at the Wilmington Light Infantry Armory on Market Street and Waddell was there and there was angst in the crowd. We have to remember that this crowd has been fed white supremacy propaganda for months leading up to the election and then uh, anger at African-Americans who were in their minds taking advantage of things. So they were angry and potentially full of whiskey and they had their guns and they wanted something to happen to break the tension that had been building up in Wilmington. And Waddell, seeing an opportunity, took the chance and organized the men to march up Market Street to, down, to go down 7th Street to the printing press where Alex Manley's printing press was. So on the morning of November 10th, uh, about 200 armed men met at Wilmington Light Infantry Armory, marched to the printing press building, which was on 7th Street near St. Luke's AME Zion Church. They knocked. Manley had been warned ahead of time that he didn't need to be there. His life was in danger. They broke in, destroyed the building, and essentially destroyed the ability of the African-American community to come together and be informed about what was going on in their city. They stopped and took a photo. Um, and then another photo and I zoomed in because these folks, you know, there's are Wilmingtonians and they're, they're very proud of what they've just done. And um, there's lots of guns in the city at this time. So there's an overall view of the destroyed building, which was owned by St. Luke's church and the destruction brought to the printing press. So Waddell meets, after the men have taken their photos, he says, you know what, you've done your duty, go home, rest in peace, the city is ours, sort of thing. Um, but these men were still full of adrenaline, and they boarded uh, trains in, in subway, not subway trains, but trolley train cars, and went over to the other side of the city where they lived. And this is the intersection of 4th and Harnett Streets in uh, Wilmington. And there was a group of African-American workers who had seen the smoke, heard the bells, heard the gunshots, and had left their jobs on the docks and were headed back towards their homes where their families were. And they stopped on the corner in front of this grocery store. Uh, the group of men who had just stepped off the trolley were behind where the photographer is. And they were yelling insults at each other across the intersection. A policeman came up try to get everyone to disperse. No one would. He left the intersection, later testified that the only people at the intersection with guns were the whites. Not five minutes after that police officer leaves, gunshots ring out. The X marks on this photograph indicate where the first two African-Americans died on the morning of November 10th as a result of this racially incited violence. From there, it's a running firefight. 
if you had, um, if you were African American, you were fleeing and you had a target on your back. The violence goes throughout the whole Brooklyn section in the north side of town. And um, there were many ways that this violence uh, was actuated, including a flying machine gun squadron, which was the way it was described by a contemporary. The businessmen of the city had purchased the machine gun to mount on the back of the wagon that you see here. And the Wilmington Light Infantry, which was a precursor to the National Guard, had created a squad to run the machine gun. And um, so they got the gun and they took it out on the river and some leading members of the African-American community were in the boat and the gun was shot across the river to show the community what that gun could do. So it was an intimidation tool. However, I think it was used at least once in the city near um, Sixth and Bladen. So this is the machine gun squadron. It's pulled through the city uh, on the north end of town, aimed at businesses, aimed at churches, demanding people come out of the facilities and um, be, let it be searched for guns because the white community felt like the African-American community was stockpiling guns. Manhattan Park is that place at the Sixth and Bladen that I was talking about. This was an African-American community center in the center of the photograph. And um, some of the white patrols felt like there was someone in Manhattan Park shooting like a sniper at the white patrols. So the machine gun was pulled to the area and through gunfire, the eight foot fence that surrounded the building is now laying on the ground because of so much gunfire. And when I talk about the numbers of people who died as a result of the violence in Wilmington, I have to use a lot of what attorneys would call circumstantial evidence uh, from my research and all of the various diaries and letters and newspaper articles and accounts. I pull them together and I figure, you know, these are the numbers of people who died. And I have a couple of different instances that make me think that as many as 25 people died at this intersection. And I don't know who these two men were who were killed here on Third Street. Um, the documents to tell me names of people who were murdered don't exist right now. They may exist in an archive somewhere or in someone's attic. So we're consistently see seeking new information. But documents like these photographs teach me as much as anything else about uh, how horrific it was to be an African-American in Wilmington. On top of the murder in the streets, the ultimate goal of the activities after the election was to regain control of city government for the people who were the Democratic Party supporters, the white supremacists. So in the afternoon of the 10th, while bullets were still flying in the streets, the um, mayor and board of aldermen were summoned to City Hall, which is Thalian Hall, and they were met with about 200 armed men, and they were um, told by the leader, Alfred Moore Wydell, that um, they should resign. And the way the city, the way the city has its um, city charter, if you were a member of the Board of Aldermen and you resigned your seat, the remaining board members would vote to fill that vacancy until the next election. And so one by one, members of the Board of Aldermen resigned and others were put in their place. So by the end of the afternoon, control of the city had switched from a legally elected government to one that was installed under military, like militia occupation of the city. So that's a coup d'etat, armed overthrow of a legally elected government. Now, Wilmington is unique because it stuck. There was no intervention. There was no federal, there was no state intervention to overturn what this armed overthrow had done. The people who were installed in control of the city government at the, the afternoon of November 10th were reaffirmed at the next election in March of 1899. So this is the only, one of the only successful coup d'etats in US history. There was a banishment campaign on top of everything else. The white community sought out and arrested and put under armed guard, leading members of the black community. And the next morning on the 11th, they were put in trains and told never to come back. They meant it. People who did try to come back were almost lynched. And um, so it effectively, between the loss of the newspaper and then the loss of leadership from civic groups, Repub um, Republican party leadership, 
church leaders and business leaders, the African-American community became decimated by the events of November 10th. Because also, while bullets are flying in the streets, people are fleeing the city in mass, going to wherever they can to perceive, to perceive safety. Many people never returned to the city after the violence. So in the aftermath, we have burial of the dead. We only have one tombstone in the African-American cemetery that has a death date of November 10th, 1898. Uh, families were burying their family members in secret and we just don't know. We don't have names. We don't have much information except for that circumstantial evidence I've been pulling together to identify those who got killed. The exodus and banishment campaign I spoke to you about already, the changes in workforce. African-American workers were being fired in mass and whites hired in their place. African-American businesses that were in the main business district were having to move in the next year to two years away from the central business district and into the African-American community. And their customers were having lower wages and lower incomes. So business owners were suffering as well. In 1900, we have the suffrage amendment that's passed as a result of the new legislature that came into office in the 1899 session. And essentially, the suffrage amendment removed the ability of African Americans to vote until the mid 20th century in the civil rights movement. Added on top of all of this, we have the first time North Carolina enacts separate but equal legislation as a result of Plessy versus Ferguson. 1899, North Carolina's legislature passes the first separ separation of the races laws, which were to separate the races in train cars. So in just a matter of uh, election season, and on November 10th, we have a complete change in the way Wilmington is operated, the way their citizens live, particularly the African-Americans and the way the state of North Carolina is managed. So quickly, I wanna talk about preserving that history because we're talking with shelters and how our homes and places in our various cities reflect our history. And because I have an audience of preservationists, I want to talk a little bit about some of these things. What we have, we have Salian Hall. It's been great. It's, it's a wonderful resource. I've been to many events there. Um, it's a landmark for both the city of Wilmington architecturally and the city of Wilmington in its history and its history with 1898. We have the Bellamy Mansion. We have opportunity. Did John D. Bellamy participate in the march to destroy the record? There's conflicting evidence and reports about whether or not he was involved in the march. He was, however, a recipient of the benefits of the 1898 election campaign because he was elected to the Congress in Washington, D.C. in the 1898 election cycle. What other spaces in town are represented or scarred? The Bellamy can, I'm challenging the Bellamy here. They have an opportunity, and I know that they're working on some of these things, to help represent and more balance the narrative in the built environment and the, in the area of Wilmington. And I know the city's been working on this and the county too, and the museum has done great work with a tool that's a map with lots of different layers of history about 1898 that I recommend you, you see. Um, we'll send you the link in an email or either put it in the chat. So what other spaces in town are represented or scarred that maybe we don't know about as well? This is the corner of 4th and Harnett. The bottom photograph is the grocery store where those first two men were killed. The upper photograph is an empty lot. And so there's nothing to tell us the tragedy that happened there. And I always advocate for more monumental marking in any way, shape or form and telling the stories of 1898 on the geography whenever possible. And so this is a perfect opportunity to do that. We don't have Frank and Alex Manley's home any longer. It's parking for other houses nearby. Uh, I use Sanborn maps quite a bit in some of the research I did. So we see an 1897, 1898 time period map. I've got it circled, there's his house. By 1915, it's gone. And you see today, thanks to Google Earth, what's still not there. Manhattan Park. That's that area where the machine gun squadron shot as many as 25 people and uh, Manhattan Park building 
in the 1897-1898 Sanborn, you see Manhattan Park on your top left corner. By 1904, the next Sanborn map that was drawn, the building is gone. And if you look at the today shot, it's an empty lot. And when I was doing my initial work in Wilmington, I'd travel around and meet with people in the community to talk about what they maybe knew about their ancestors' involvement in 1898. And I spoke to a woman who grew up on the opposite street, on 7th Street, and she told me that Manhattan Park block, she knew it was called Manhattan Park, but it had always been vacant. There had never, ever been anything there. And I started showing her the photographs. I started showing her the uh, documentation. And she was amazed that this vital part of her history on the same block as that she lived had been obliterated. So there's another scar on the landscape that doesn't have representation in the total history. We don't have Love and Charity Hall in St. Luke's any longer. It's a parking lot for the church. And if you see the Sanborn map from 1897, 1898, you see Negro Hall in the bottom left corner. And in the photograph of the um, aftermath of the destruction of the building, you see St. Luke's Church in the corner. So St. Luke's and the community there have done some work to keep the story of Manley's destroyed printing press building alive, but there are no real markers in that area. Now, the one thing we have is the only example of reparations as a result of the violence on November 10th was to St. Luke's to help reimburse the church for the loss of their building. And what we do have, we have a challenge to preserve what's left of 1898 with proper interpretation and a challenge to find the next steps in the journey for truth and understanding, for healing and then moving forward together. And I will leave my talking at that because here is Christopher if he'd like to add some things. Uh, thanks, <laughs> Lorraine. <laughs> Um, but yeah, a great present presentation. Um, it's one of the reasons <laughs> why I got you involved in Wilmington on Fire. But if folks out there who aren't familiar um, with my documentary, my documentary is called Wilmington on Fire. It's a documentary on this exact topic, um, the 1898 Wilmington Massacre um, in Wilmington, North Carolina. And, you know, just like you, you said, Lorraine, um, it's, you know, it's about preserving this history. Um, and that was one of the many reasons why I did this film. Um, you know, I saw no one actually do a documentary on it. And I said, you know what? Let me put my film skills to the test. I was able to, to get other like-minded individuals that really wanted to preserve and tell this history and get it out at a larger scale um, through a documentary format. And that's what we did. Um, so I think, you know, everyone can kind of do their part. You know, whether it's, you know, you don't have to do a, a documentary project or, you know, write a book. People might not be as talented as that, but just the small things, you know, of, you know, utilizing, you know, this type of education um, and things that are coming out there about this history, you know, to really, um, you know, tell this history, you know, with, within your groups, you know, your social organizations, churches and everything um, and start different initiatives to really, like Lorraine was saying, you know, we need more monuments and markers um, to represent this history. Um, so folks can know, you know, the true history and the true interpretation of it. And that's what I'm trying to do. Um, even with the first one, uh, we exceeded expectations uh, with the film <laughs> and it's still going strong. We're currently um, shooting and filming, almost done with Wilmington on Fire Chapter 2, which really looks at Wilmington today and, you know, kind of goes back to what you were saying of um, really trying to preserve this history and really tell the story, you know, more fully but also talk about the different aspects of what it's gonna take, I guess, to move, to help move the city forward. You know, whether it's entrepreneurship in the black community, uh, whether it's, you know, grassroots activism, um, community organizing, education, um, learning history. Um, so that's where, you know, we tackle all those different um, elements of really showing folks that are doing that type of work in Wilmington to really help move the city forward, so. I was going to ask you a question before I <clears throat> turn it over to the official Q and A. Um, I know in the film you um, feature Larray, which mm -hmm. is incredible, but also some of the um, descendants of yes. some of the, the black residents who were, you know, owned property, had businesses. 
um, you know, really were, were thriving in Wilmington prior to um, this insurrection. And I was, you know, wanted you to speak a little bit about, you know, what, what awareness they had of that, um, you know, how they see this, um, uh, this point in history kind of impacting their lives in, in Wilmington today and, you know, how, you know, Black folks have been able to, um, you know, have, have missed out on opportunities because this happened um, that are impacting them currently. Yeah, well, I think the, the, the two main descendants that we had featured in the film uh, was the grandson of Alex Manley, um, um, Dr. Lewin Manley, and also the great granddaughter of Thomas C. Miller, uh, Miss Faye Chaplin. Um, and, you know, Larray just, um, you know, spoke about Alex Manley. So talking to Dr. Manley about his grandfather, you know, growing up, he never really knew much about it, about 1898. He knew about his grandfather and knew that his grandfather had a newspaper in North Carolina, but he didn't know why they actually left. And so it wasn't until later down in life, you know, where he, you know, really started researching and talking to like family members and they, you know, really opened up to him to tell him about what happened. And so I, I noticed that with a lot of descendants, you know, this is before LaRae's book and stuff like that, where she was just saying that, you know, a lot of people, they, they heard some things, but they didn't know, I guess, the details. You know, you heard about the massacre, especially when the Wilmington 10 happened as well back in the 70s. But, you know, people heard about it, but they didn't know the details and, and the whole, you know, what it was all about. And so, you know, when folks, you know, Leon Preta, you know, when he came out of his book, We Have Taken the City, you know, Lorray comes out with her research and her book. Um, and then, you know, with Wilmington on Fire, they, you know, they continue that. Um, I started to see also more descendants, you know, come out. Um, ever since Wilmington on Fire has been out, I've had um, direct descendants hit me up from all over the country. Um, I know one guy, he's up in New York, and he was posting on social media like last year, and he had a picture of his great grandfather. Says great grandfather left Wilmington um, around around 1898. I think like the end of like December of 1898. And he said, you know, he never knew why. And then I saw somebody comment on his page, you know, on his post and tagged the film and said, man, you should check out Wilmington on Fire. This is probably the reason why. And so he reached out to me and was just telling me about it. And he said, yeah, I never, we never knew why, why our grandfather, you know, great grandfather left. And so he started tying it in and he found his name in the, you know, the old directories and everything. And so it looks like he left because of, as a result of the 1898 massacre. Um, so, you know, a lot of people just didn't pass this down, especially in the African-American community, because, you know, it was, it was a lot of fear. I know even with Dr. Lewin Manley, you know, some of the stories he shared with me and certain, certain other um, Manley's descendants as well said that, you know, he feared for his life, even living in Philadelphia later on in life, you know, after he leaves Wilmington, he, um, they said that he had a bodyguard even up there because he was just the fear, you know, of people coming from North Carolina, from Wilmington and doing harm to him and his family. And so, you know, when these type of things happen, you know, especially in our community back then, you know, we just didn't talk about it and just try to suppress it as much as we can, you know, but people are learning about it. People are, are you know, doing what they have to do to really tell the history. And I just saw recently yesterday, um, there's a, 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 an initiative to um, start seeking out more um, direct descendants and really trying to honor those direct descendants as well of the massacre. So people are, you know, doing some initiatives um, now of really gathering direct descendants and really try to preserve this history. Thanks, Chris. So we've got some questions, so I'm going to go and jump in um, to those. And folks, you can certainly, um, there's a Q&A button. Um, so if you have a question, go ahead and, and type it in and we'll get that um, asked. Um, so uh, this is from Lisa Coates. Uh, there has been a rumor that red shirts were former soldiers recently returned from the Spanish-American War. Is there any proof of this? And also weren't red shirts active in South Carolina as well as North Carolina? So um, yes, to the question about um, recently furloughed men who had been soldiers in the Spanish-American War. They were in Wilmington. They were part of the Wilmington Light Infantry's militia that was patrolling the city. And they were um, very involved 
with lots of those different aspects. Uh, we don't have a roster of red shirts, so we don't know if they were also red shirts, but we do know that some Spanish American War soldiers and some men from the Naval Reserves were also involved in um, suppressing uh, folks in Wilmington in 1898. The governor called out the Wilmington Light Infantry officially to ask the Wilmington Light Infantry to press for the peace when bullets started flying in the streets. And so that is um, one way that those folks were being involved. But the WLI was comprised of people who were the ones who were causing the problem in the first place. So it's a little bit of a back and forth between who's doing what sometimes. And um, what was the second part of that question? It was, um, weren't the red shirts active in South Carolina as well as North Carolina? Yes, actually the red shirt phenomenon came to North Carolina from South Carolina because Ben Tillman in South Carolina used the red shirts as a tool to break reconstruction in that state. And uh, Tillman was involved, was consulted on how to do the red shirt thing in North Carolina at the beginning of the um, election campaign season. And so it's very much tooled after what happened in South Carolina with the red shirts. And in fact, in other parts of North Carolina along the state border, South Carolinians were coming into border towns and doing some of that harassing. So in Laurenburg and in Robinson County and in Mecklenburg County, you see red shirt activity. And a lot of times it's South Carolinians as much as North Carolinians doing red shirt work. Yeah, I totally agree. That's want to say, you know, I'm from Laurenburg as well. <laughs> so that's that's another thing that uh, attracted me to doing this project, you know, doing research, just like what Lorraine was saying, um, finding out that you had a lot of red shirt activity, even from where I was from. And then I know uh, Ben Tillman, um, you know, I know he had quoted, he's quoted the saying that, you know, when the whole controversy with Alex Manley um, happened, I think he said something about, you know, if he was down here in South Carolina, we would have hung him a long time ago. You know, he was, that was a direct quote towards Alex Manley. So yeah, definitely um, you know, red, shirt, red shirt activity was definitely heavy around that North South Carolina border. Okay, thank you all. Um, so our next question is, uh, did violence occur in other NC localities at the same time encouraged by the News and Observer? So um, yes, mostly through the work of the red shirt activities and many times like I was saying, you'd have a speech given by a Democratic Party operative in a community, and then there was a red shirt rally after that, and then the red shirts would get emboldened, and then after the official rally, they'd ride through uh, African American communities, and they would harass voters, um, keep people from signing up to vote. There was a whole lot of intimidation by red shirts to remind black voters that they knew if you registered to vote and if you registered to vote, you would potentially lose your job. And so that sort of harassment happened across the southern border in uh, red shirt territories. Um, the white supremacy movement was full of vitriol across North Carolina, whether it was red shirts or not. And um, there was harassment and intimidation, but because November 10th happened in Wilmington, it didn't really have to happen anywhere else after that. All these men had to say was, you know what happened in Wilmington, and if you want to have that happen here, we'll do that. Um, and so it was an intimidation tool, again, over and above everything else to say, you know, people got away with murder in the streets in Wilmington, and we can do that here if we need to. So... Um, there's a couple of instances where red shirts killed people in the lead up to the election in some of the other counties along the southern border. Um, but it's not as well known a story. And it's one thing I've started researching too. We have a couple folks that have a similar question about um, population, uh, black population in Wilmington and what it was before and then the change after. So it's, a, it's how many people were killed um, in the insurrection and then what was the black population before in Wilmington and then what was it afterwards? So as I said, 
in my talk, we really don't have any one clear document that we can point to that says this many people died. What we have is a body of evidence that says somebody died. I, I wrote, this person wrote a letter to his family who wasn't in Wilmington and said, I saw a dead person on this corner. And another letter would say, I saw somebody get shot on that corner, or I saw a wagon load of bodies at this point. And so taking all of that information together, along with the Wilmington Light Infantry's own documentation where they would have meetings on the anniversary of November 10th every year. So a year after the event, they came together and they had a big bonfire and oyster roast out on the beach. And they wrote a narrative for themselves of what happened. So all of these documents together help us understand how many people died. And so conservatively, I say 25 to 40 little bit more, less conservative, I'd go 40 to 60. Uh, however, if you take a really liberal reading of the documentation, you could say up to 120 that I found. But um, it's so difficult to get an idea because many of times these people are not named. We don't have death certificates from the period. So it's a matter of doing research and collating the research and layering information on top of information. Thanks, Lorraine. Um, we have a question from Mark Bell. He wanted to know, what did Alfred Moore Waddell do for a living? He seemed to have a lot of time on his hands. Yeah, he did. He was on, he was down and out and not in the best of financial circumstances. So his ability to be a good speech maker sort of helped him line his pockets. And then he became mayor of the city of Wilmington. And that was a very lucrative position. And he remained mayor for many years after that. Um, he was an attorney by trade and had been a Civil War Confederate officer. But he was so down on his luck, I believe his wife had to give piano lessons to help supplement the family income. Um, this is a question from Susan Little. Um, could you speak about Governor Charles B. Acock's role? Charles Acock was, uh, like Waddell, a speechmaker on behalf of the Democratic Party campaign, and he would travel, he traveled to a lot of speech events across North Carolina and did as much as possible to support the platform of the Democratic Party and the white supremacy campaign and became the face. As much as Waddell was advocating for Wilmington, Acock became one of the faces that people would see all along the state to promote the white supremacy Democratic Party platform. And Josephus Daniels wrote in his autobiography that ACOC was rewarded with the governor's office in 1900 for his work in the 1898 campaign. Thank you. Um, we have a question from Tim Pinnock. Um, was there actually a committee of colored citizens established by the black community or was it just made a made up label used by the insurrectionist? So um, the insurrectionists, I believe from what I've read and the names of the people that are on the committee, that they were a made up committee by the white supremacy groups to represent the clergy, the business interests, the Republican Party interests, and other civic and community organizations. And those leaders were the ones who were called together by the White Declaration of Independence Committee, and they were called the Committee of Colored Citizens at that point. It wasn't a committee that had been operating, as far as I know, in the city prior to that. Um, I'm going to kind of combine these questions. Um, has there been contact with descendants of the um, the supremacists or the insurrectionists, and did they KKK play any role in this situation? The KKK did not play a role. Um, the KKK was involved in U.S. history in the time before and around the end of Reconstruction, around 1877, and the KKK sort of dies out in importance because they accomplished what they wanted to accomplish, which was Democratic Party rule. Uh, the red shirts come in in 1898 and 1900 and sort of do what the KKK normally did, but they did it in a scarier way because they were in broad daylight 
their faces uncovered. They wanted you to know who they were and they wanted them, they wanted everybody to know what was going on and they were empowered and felt like they could get away with what they were doing. So the KKK comes back into our history at the turn of the 20th century and the beginning of the civil rights movement. As far as contact with descendants of the white supremacists, there has been some and um, during the 1998 centennial observances, several of them came forward and spoke about what their ancestors did and what maybe their take at that time was on the events. Um, I've spoken to a handful of them and just like the story of 1898 was buried in the black community, it was also buried in the white community at many levels. And so people whose grandfathers were very instrumental in what happened in 1898. They may not have been pulling the triggers on the guns, but they made the guns available. And they were part of this Democratic Party leadership. Their grandchildren had no idea and had learned about what their grandfathers did at the same time as everyone else during the centennial observances. So, um, you know, and there are a few people who have come forward who acknowledge that their ancestors were red shirts. And so that's a different narrative too. So just a few. Yeah. Um, let's see. Uh, who owns the two empty lots now um, where the corner store and the, the park were? I don't know if you even would know that, either one of you, but. Uh, um, I have. Oh, go ahead, Lori. Go ahead. I, I kind of I know one of them. It's it's a late, the Manhattan Park spot site is owned by a woman who lives in Atlanta who owns the corner lot and a house, the next house over that's facing Bladen. And I can't remember her name. I don't think it's too very difficult to find that kind of information though. Right. I've got it somewhere in my computer. <laughs> what do you and, have to add, Chris? Oh, and I was saying then, and probably, you know, the fourth and Hornet location on um, the empty lot. I don't, I don't really know. I know they had some, some stuff over there for sale at one time. It still might be to sell over there. So like you said, um, it's just looking it up and you can easily find it, <laughs> so. Well, I mean, that fourth and higher net site is one of the places where I get on my soapbox because yeah. across the street have been new, new businesses put in yeah. that cater to breweries and yeah. loud music and all this stuff. You know, I'm not necessarily against that. Right. We may have, Lorraine, you still there? I think she locked up, up on, on us. us, froze up on us. Yeah, she was preaching. <laughs> <laughs> Lorraine! Yeah. Let's see. Yeah. But I kind of, uh, you know, I, I kind of get what she was saying. She was pretty much saying, you know, a lot of the gentrification um, that's going on over there right now. Um, and it seems like that history is getting lost. Um, so I remember when I first started coming to Wilmington, 2010, researching, and um, no, a lot of that stuff wasn't even there yet. And you see now, 2021, like Lori was saying, breweries are popping up, condominiums. I know they're building some big lofts um, right across the street from 1898 Park. Um, so you're seeing a lot of the gentrification coming around that area, and it, you know, and it could, um, it seems like that history, you know, might get lost as well during that whole process. I think that's what you were trying to say, Lorraine. Yeah, so, I'll, did I fall out on you? <laughs> yeah, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> we lost you for a, a second there. Sorry, sorry. That's <laughs> okay. Um, we have lots of questions. I'm going to try to um, skim through some of these to see what we haven't. Um, covered i think was was the walker grocery store a black owned store i believe it was a white store yeah white store okay um let's see i see a question about wilmington's economy after the coup um black workers were paid less white workers were hired instead of black workers in many places um so the overall economic indicator for the city for African Americans went down while the economic indicators for whites went up. However, it was depressed even for the white community because economists have seen where both races move together, the entire community goes better together. But um, so we saw a lot of businesses close and a lot of men fled the city and women were left. And so we have a lot of women supporting households as laundresses and domestic workers. 
Gotcha. Um, I did want to ask this question. Um, where do you all think people need to be looking for um, information and history? Is it like, you know, up in your attic, talking to your relatives? Where do folks need to be, you know, if they think they have a connection um, to this, looking for that information? Everywhere. I mean, you know, I was go, <laughs> yeah. when I was working on the report back in 2005, a woman came to one of my talks where I would give talks like this, similar to the one I just gave today in the community and ask for people in the community to consider, is, do you have any family history? Do you have anything? And this woman, a few days later, came into Beverly Tetterton at the local library and she had a series of photographs, all of which I used today because she, in one fatal swoop, doubled the amount of photographs we had of the day of the violence. So I don't think the lady had gotten out of the building yet before Beverly had them scanned and sent to me in Raleigh. <laughs> but um, so those types of things can be anywhere. She said, you know, my children don't like history, so I'm giving these to the library so they can be saved. I know nat natural disasters have caused problems for the preservation of records. Um, St. Luke's Church burned in the 1950s. So any records that the church may have had about it's Love and Charity Hall or Alex Manley. Those records were destroyed unless they had been in someone's home. And that person was maybe the secretary for the congregation. And their great-grandchildren are now cleaning out an attic and they find these things. Right. We just, you don't know, never know. Right. I know. Right. Um, yeah, you, you're exactly right. Uh, I know one guy, um, when we were doing Wilmington on Fire. Um, and whenever you watch the film, you see a photo of a black police officer. Um, before the 1898 massacre, well, we got that photo from from a guy. He um, that was actually his great great grandfather, and he had this photo that was passed down from generation to generation. He said when he was a kid, his family used to try to tell him about, hey, you know, our great great grandfather was was a black police officer before the 1898 massacre. Then after 1898 happened, you know, he was taken off the force, and so he never paid attention. You know, he said, man, I wish I would have paid attention so I could contribute to your project, but use this photo, man. Use this in the project the best way you can. He still has the, the old nightstick and everything. And so, you know, just you'd be surprised, you know, what's really at your house or your, your great grandparents, grandparents' house that, you know, a lot of folks kept things, but a lot of times, you know, folks just throw it away. They just want to, they think of, of it as junk, but, you know, definitely hit up your, you know, your local archivist. Cape Fear Museum, the library, and or the Preservation NC. You know, you ha we have organizations out here. You know, even if you don't think it's nothing, find an organization and they can definitely do something with it because you never know what you have. You never know. It's like yeah. there's this man, his day book is in the collections at UNC Chapel Hill. And all he did in his day book was record the date and the weather. That's all he recorded. And so I know on November 10th that the weather in the morning and daytime was nice. And by nighttime, it was sleety. And it's just his day book where he only recorded the weather. So you never, ever know. I'm going to give our, do our last question and comment. And then I wanted to give Chris the opportunity to talk a little bit about where folks can watch the film, how they can watch the film and what other projects you're working on. So let me ask this, um, I'll take this question from uh, Catherine Beicher. Um, the white Wilmington soldiers who were in the Spanish-American War were back on furlough. Wilmington and other towns, black soldiers in the same war were still out of state on garrisons. Was this co coincidence and what difference did it make? I don't believe in coincidence in 1898. So it's right. The white men were released from duty and allowed to return back to Wilmington uh, to vote and then to be on hand as trained soldiers should they be necessary. The African-American men who had volunteered to fight for the Spanish-American War were still held in garrisons in Florida and other parts of the country and were not allowed off of their bases for the most part. They're, and so that potential group of trained, armed African-American men was absent from the city 
on that day. Now, if they had been there and had had access to their guns as soldiers, would it have had a different outcome? I have no idea. Would it have had the same outcome but more bloodshed? That might be the case. We just don't know. But it, I don't believe in coincidence and, and anything related to 1898 any longer. <laughs> and, and also, um, I know a lot of people, you know, they see the film or read books, read the books about 1898. You know, they always ask, you know, did, uh, you know, what was the, I guess, the public out, outcry, outrage? Um, you know, a lot of people were writing about it. I know I was doing some research the other day and found a, an article, I think, from New York. And they were talking about some folks up in Brooklyn, New York, were really outraged and demanded that, um, that Waddell and others be lynched um, for these crimes. Mm -hmm. And they also said that they'll send money um, for guns for the African-American community. So you had like articles out there, you know, that were talking about this, that, you know, a lot of people around the country were very outraged by this, about what was going on in North Carolina and South Carolina as well, right there on the line. Um, but yeah. So. Yeah. Um, so yes, there was one comment from um, Garrett that our Bellevue Mansion if you all have questions about current owners, um, you can look up the public tax records to find out who those people are. Um, I did wanna say, I'm gonna wrap up the questions, but if you have a burning question that we did not get to, um, feel free to email um, me and I will shoot that to um, Lorraine and Chris and see if they can answer it. Yeah. Um, with your uh, registration for the webinar, if you just reply to that, that email will come to me so you can do it that way. Um, but I wanted to give Chris a chance to talk about um, Wilmington on Fire and where folks can watch that and um, any other projects that he's yeah. that he's working on. Cool, yeah. Well, Wilmington on Fire, um, you can check it out on Amazon Prime, Quelle T, Quelle TV if you have that, Vimeo on Demand, but Amazon Prime, I would say, is the main location right now. Also, in about, I would say, in May, we'll be also be broadcasting on Free Speech TV. Uh, Free Speech TV, you know, they show Democracy Now!, other programming. Um, so we'll be doing some broadcast uh, dates um, with, that, with that network um, very soon in a couple months. So be on the lookout for that. But definitely support the film on Amazon Prime. Um, we're currently wrapping up Wilmington on Fire Chapter 2. Still got to film some stuff with LeRae <laughs> with that one as well. We'll work that out real soon. But yeah, so we're doing that, finishing up a, a great martial arts documentary about a historic uh, martial artist that's here in North Carolina, um, Grandmaster Vic Moore. So we're about 90% done with that, about to wrap that up. And also about to start very soon um, on a documentary project with Preservation NC as well about the profiles of Black architects and builders in North Carolina. And it's a project I'm very excited about. And um, so definitely everybody stay, stay in tune and stay in touch with that. So more information will definitely be coming soon about that. Awesome. And I was going to mention to folks, um, there are several links and resources um, that folks have put in the, the Q&A. If you will put those in the chat um, function so that um, other folks can have access to that and they can see it. Just the panelists myself can see the Q&A, but there's some great links and resources um, for, uh, for folks to, to check out. And I, I think it's fair to say you all that, that this, there's more attention being drawn to this, this piece of history. Um, so, I, and I think that it's, that's great and that folks in any way they can should be pushing whoever they need to, to make sure that that, um, that this, this, that continues to happen. Um, uh, so yeah. Um, I think that's it. If you guys have any, any last, any last remarks or anything. No. I'm glad that I can talk about 1898 at any opportunity. I'd be more than happy to come back and do another follow-up that's more deep dive into different bits of the story now that we have a basic history. Chris is a great co-panelist on lots of stuff and um, his movie is a great resource. I recommend everybody have a look at that. Um, the research I did built on the shoulders of previous research and new research is happening every day. So we can't ever say that we know everything that there is to know about 1898. 
Um, I think the overall framework won't ever change, but the individual stories that make it real are the things that we're continuing to find. And um, so if anybody has a question about something that they may have a resource or they don't know what to do with, I'm more than happy to help them figure out a repository or a museum to go to. Of course, the one there in Wilmington is awesome. And um, so I highly recommend folks go to the museum and talk to the curators there. Um, saw a couple questions about comparing 1898 to January 6th. And I've been doing a lot of interviews with people from across the spectrum since the beginning of the campaign season last year. And um, while we can probably draw some comparisons between the types of people who were doing some of the raids in Wilmington and then storming the Capitol, uh, it's like we've said, we've been researching Wilmington for over a hundred years and we don't know everything that there is to know about it. I think we're too close in time still to what happened on January 6th to understand everything that on January 6th meant, who was involved and at what level and how much planning was going into it. So I think we need to let historians of the future do a lot of those comparisons for us while we're still trying to come to grips with what happened. Um, again, if you guys can take some time. Well, one, thank you, Lorraine and Chris. This was this was excellent. We had a really good crowd. Um, again, this is recorded, um, and so we'll make it available on our website um, to take a look look at. There are a lot of great resources um, out there to continue um, researching this. And please take a moment to fill out that survey and let us know um, what you thought about today's session and check out Chris's film is really incredible. Um, I, I saw it, I, I highly recommend it. So um, with that, we will uh, see you all next time. And go to the Bellamy Mansion, they're open. Yes. If you wanna know more immediately in research that that is available uh, right now. All right, thanks everyone. Bye, thanks, thank you. Bye.